Hi, I'm Molly Stone. I'm the major specialist here at the SBC of Wake County. This is my friend Franny. And uh, if you are watching this video, it's because you are interested in learning how we do basic obedience training for the pets here at the SPCA. Um, and we really appreciate your interest. We would not be able to continue our program at all without the help of the volunteers. Um, and right now, Fran is demonstrating some impolite behaviors. So before before I get started with her, I want to I want to explain a couple of, of um, a couple things about our methodology in general at the SPCA. First thing is that we are non-aversive trainers, and that means we don't use any methods for training animals that rely on pain or fear to cause learning. Uh, not just because it isn't nice, which does matter, but also because pain and fear both cause learning to um, to be blocked, and um, so it doesn't work. So that's why I'm not being Franny in the chest for jumping up on me, and it is why we don't alpha roll, and it's why we don't use pinch collars or prong collars or e-collars. Uh, instead, our methodology is based on uh, positive reinforcement and operant and classical conditioning, which is where we pay the dogs for doing the right thing, and we remove their opportunity to get paid if they are making mistakes. And so, if you have any questions about any of that, you're welcome to find the purple shirt. Um, all of our staff people in the, in the animal care area wear bright purple shirts that say staff on the back, or you can come find me uh, in the behavior office, or you can shoot me an email at mstone at spcawake.org. Okay, so, we're gonna get started. Franny is, um, is one of my, my team members' pet dogs. She was adopted from the SPCA as a puppy. She's an eight-month-old American Pit Bull Terrier, and um, she's very lovely, but she really, 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 really loves the treats that I have in my hands. So she's trying everything that she's ever learned to get me to give them to her, uh, and someone has taught her to speak. <laughs> so um, right now, while I'm talking to you, I have to be sure that I'm not reinforcing Franny for anything other than the behaviors that I want. And I do want to sit, and I do want calmness, and I don't want jumping, and I don't want yapping. Um, so, <coughs> Franny likes to speak. She's got a lot to say. Okay, so, <coughs> so we use hand gestures to teach basic obedience signals. And the first basic obedience signal that we teach to all the animals, all the dogs, is to sit. Good. And it looks like that. Your palm facing the ceiling. Open, empty palm. Um, and obviously, Brandon has seen this before. Good. When you're first teaching this, you might find that it's useful to stand on the leash a little bit so that if the dog decides to jump up, jump up, jump up, jump up to get to the food, it's a little bit less successful for them. Um, good. And the way it works is you just hold your open palm above the dog's head with a piece of food in it. And eventually, the little behind hits the ground, and that's because dogs don't have very good balance when they're looking up at the sky. And so they, they kind of accidentally sit, and then you pay them cash, and they go, holy cow. All I did was put my little behind on the ground, and then food fell out of the sky, and they figure that out very quickly, and pretty soon you don't need any food in your hand, and this becomes, yes, good girl. Your hand gesture for sit. Okay. Good girl, very nice. Which brings me to a very important concept, which is called your reinforcement schedule. Reinforcement schedule is how frequently you are going to pay the dog for succeeding. When we're teaching a new skill, we pay them on a constant reinforcement schedule. That means every single time they get it right, we give them cash. Uh, but very, very quickly, as quickly as possible, we want to switch that to a random reinforcement schedule, which means sometimes you give them cash, good girl, and sometimes Good girl. Sometimes you don't. If we continue to feed um, our subjects every single single time they perform for us, the first time we need them to do something and we don't have a paycheck for them, they're going to refuse. Why should they work for free when they can work for money every other time? So what we want to do is set ourselves up to be unpredictable with our reinforcers. Yes! Come on. Woo! Good girl, Franny. 
And so I asked her for three sits that time for the same amount of money I've been paying her for just one sit. And if, I want you to think about it like the difference between um, a soda machine and a slot machine. If you put money into a soda machine and it doesn't give you a soda, that can become very frustrating and irritating people and makes people angry. You do expect to get paid every single time you put money into a soda machine. On the other hand, if you put money into a slot machine and it doesn't pay you immediately, most people are compelled at that point to put more money in to repeat the behavior. Because they know that they might not get paid, but they also know that they might. And it might be something amazing, and it could be any time now. So, think of yourself when you're reinforcing the belt when you're training them on the slot machine instead of a coat machine. Um, and what you're going to find is that the behaviors become really sticky. They stick in the dog's brains and they become kind of obsessed with, uh, with sitting when they're asked to do it. Good girl. Franny's finding it frustrating that she's doing so many sits. Good. And, uh, and not getting paid as frequently as she'd like. Um, that's just too bad. Sorry, Franny. You don't get paid extra for yelling at me. But I can tell that she's getting a little bored. And that's my job as a trainer to make sure that she doesn't get bored. Uh, because this is what happens when you let a dog get bored. They start to lose interest and pretty soon she's going to leave if I don't increase my awesomeness. So remember, random reinforcement schedule is important, but so is extreme awesomeness. Good girl. And one of the things that dogs find awesome, yes, good. Good. Is thinking. Good. They like to practice. They like to be challenged. And they like to try and figure out puzzles. If you make the puzzles too hard, they'll quit and walk away. So you have to make sure that you're working at a level they can understand and succeed at. So Franny is getting bored and she needs to be challenged. But what I'm going to do is add another skill. She's tired of sitting, sitting, sitting. And uh, she thinks that jumping is going to give her more money than, uh, than sitting down. So I'm going to start practicing down with her. And this is the way that we teach the down. It's very similar to the stick. You use a, you use your palm for a hand signal. Um, but for the down, we point at the ground with your palm facing downwards instead of up. And you wait, good girl, until those front elbows, until her elbows hit the floor. And that counts as a down. Very nice. And at the beginning, you're probably going to have to bend all the way down or even Sometimes you even have to get on the floor with the dog if they're not really understanding. Um, and the reason for that is that bending over a dog like this, looming over the dog, can be perceived as really uncomfortable and threatening. And that makes dogs want to back away from you instead of lying down at your feet. So remember that when a dog lies down, they're in a very, very vulnerable position, and that can make them really uncomfortable. So this, this does require some patience at the beginning. So if you have to get down on the ground, good girl. In order, to, in order to make them feel comfortable when you're giving them the down signal, that's perfectly fine. But you do want to stand that up as quickly as you can because it's not really convenient for anybody to have to get down on one knee um, just in order to get their dogs to lie down. So, so you can start with that step. And then what we do, just like we do with every single, um, every single obedience signal, is we gradually increase the criteria. So you might need to start out on the ground, but very quickly you want to stand up. Good girl. So that she can figure out that that palm facing the ground pointing at the floor means to lie down regardless of where your body is. And then, after she masters that, you want to start to bend a little bit less. Good. Just give her a little bit less assistance each time. Now this method that I'm using is called lure and reward. I'm using the food as a lure to bring her nose down to the floor. As soon as her body is where I want it, I'm paying her that reward. Um, and I do need to get the lure out of my hand as quickly as possible, and then I'm going to randomize my reinforcement schedule. But right now, I want to see if I can stand that signal up so that eventually I just point it to the ground like this or like this, and then she'll lie down. You gotta get up. Franny likes down. Down is relaxing. Come here, please. Oh my goodness. Come on. Yes, good puppy. Good. Good girl, sweetheart. Let me sit. Yes. Good. Over 
Good girl. Very nice. And I'll just practice that with Brandy until I can stand all the way up at my regular height in order to give her that down. And then I want to remove that lure from my hand as quickly as possible. Good. Good girl. A little bit harder for her when she saw that I didn't have the paycheck in my signal hand, but that's okay. Just gonna be really, really patient with her. She doesn't know exactly what's required. Got to give her a little bit of time to figure it out. Empty, empty lower hand. Signal. Good girl. You can see, it was much faster compliance that time because she's starting to get the hang of it. And that's what you're gonna notice. When your dog starts to learn what, what you're wanting them to learn, you won't wonder if their success was fluky or not. You'll, you'll, you'll be able to really tell that uh, they're getting it right on purpose. Okay, so, so far, we have this is in, this is down. We're using no methodology that re relies on pain or fear to cause pain. All right, and so the next thing we teach them after they master sit and they master the down is the stay. This is our stay calm. It's an open and calm facing the animal. Granny gets bored, she starts barking because someone told her to someone told her to speak. It's actually pretty charming, I'm afraid I must admit. Okay, but it means she's bored and she's annoyed because she's not getting paid. So it means I gotta pay less attention to you and more attention to her. That's a big fail. Franny does understand stay, but the stay is boring. She already told me that she's bored. So, instead of going straight into the stay, what I'm gonna do is give her a couple of cool things to do. Good girl. Yes. Oh my gosh, what a good girl. Woo! Yay! Very nice. Good. I'm going to make that stay real, real quick. You'll notice that I'm putting my empty hand stay signal in front of my hand with the lure because I know that this hand is where Franny's eyes are. All I care about right now is that she doesn't move out of that sit. Stay is always part two of two part signal. So you'll have a sit stay or a down stay or even a stand stay. Um, and really, the barking is not ideal, but I'm not trying to teach her not to bark right now. I'm trying to teach her what sit stay means. And so, let's pay more attention to the stay and less attention to the speak. Good. Different dogs. Good need to progress at different paces. Franny has to go fast or she gets bored really, really quickly. Mm. Yes, much better. Good. I'll let her correct that herself. She knows that jumping on me doesn't work. She knows that sitting down for me does work. And so I just had to give her a minute to remember that. And then I'm going to reinforce it. And the more, the more opportunity she has to make that mistake and then correct it, the less frequently she's going to make it. It's no fun for Franny to fail. It's a lot more fun for her to get for her to get paid uh, for doing the right thing. So she chooses to do that, to do it right. Good girl. When she's given the opportunity to, uh, to figure it out for herself. Good. Good girl. Once I can get them to to sit stay for about three to five seconds with me standing still. I want to add some movement into that as quickly as possible because eventually you want to be able to have the dog steady while you good girl. Brush your teeth or make a sandwich or walk around your house or maybe, I don't know, walk around your neighborhood or take them into an obedience ring and have them sit stay for five minutes while you leave and you're out of their sight. But we start with one tiny step to the side. Good girl. And as that becomes easier for her, we can increase the distance. Now, Franny moved there, and I noticed she was about to fail. So I stopped moving. So I want her to see. Good, that's better. Good girl. Very nice. Very, very good. All right. Right here. Oh, good girl. And I had to add a little bit of, I had to mix it up a little bit for her there because stay is super boring. <laughs> and Franny is easily, easily, easily bored. So. As you get to know each of the dogs, you'll start to realize that each of them have those special needs like that. So Franny failed. She got up before I want her to get up. 
And so I just didn't feed her the treat that time, and that's actually the punisher. Does Rain want the food? Yes. Yes, she does want the food. And so when I take it away, and she misses her opportunity to earn it, that's called a negative punisher. It doesn't rely on pain or fear to cause learning, but it does reduce the likelihood that that, that, that behavior is gonna, uh, is gonna be repeated, the behavior of getting up and breaking the stick. Downstay is very similar, um, except they're in a down when you teach it. And so, good. 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 Again. Yes. Good. Open empty palm. Facing the dog. Good girl. She shifted her weight there when I shifted mine. Good. I thought she might fail, and so. Before she had time to stand up, I went ahead and reinforced her because I wanted her to be successful. Good girl. The first milestone in a down stay is when you can stand back up at your regular height and your dog stays on the ground. Once you get to that point, you can start very slowly again, adding a little distance. teach this today, we add the three D's separately. The three D's on stay, you're done, you can get up, oh my goodness, are distance, duration, and distractions. So you go from one second to five seconds to 10 seconds, and then within that 10 seconds, maybe you can add a few steps, or you can walk all the way around in a circle, and then you add a little more duration, and maybe you get her up to 30 seconds, and then Maybe you can walk around the whole room, uh, or you could roll the ball about 20 feet away from her. So you want to add those things separately, um, because we need to make sure they're succeeding at kindergarten level before we ship them off to graduate school, right? Okay, so, so, so far we have the sit, the down, and the stay, which goes with both the sit and the down. And the last obedient signal that we really concentrate on here while the dogs are in our adoption program is the recall. That is also known as come or come here. This is how you get your dog to, to come when she's called. So Franny and I are gonna demonstrate the way we teach the recall signal. Um, there's some rules about this. While I'm telling you the rules, Franny might get impatient. She really, really likes this exercise. And actually, her joy about this exercise is one of the reasons we teach it that way. Um, the recall signal can save dogs' lives, so it's very, very important that they get it straight. And so, it's extra super important that we don't use any kind of aversive um, stimulus when we're trying to teach this. You know, so if your dog finally, finally, finally comes back to you after you've been calling for 20 minutes, and then you spank him for not listening, the next time you call him, he's gonna remember that the last time he came to you, he got in big trouble. And it's not gonna be easy for him to choose to leave whatever he's doing and come to you, especially if, you know, you might, if you might not be nice when he gets there. So. The recall is always taught with joy, and it is always taught in a way that gets the dog to choose on their own to come to you. So we don't drag them on the leash, and we don't chase them down. And so the way we do it is to run backwards away from the dog, because that makes us fascinating. Good girl. Right, come! Yes, good girl, very nice. We're gonna show you that again. You'll notice I'm saying the word come one time, and trying to make the tone a little bit different than my regular speaking voice. And when she gets to me, it's a little bit of a party. On a tiny six foot long leash. There's pretty much no way she can fail and set up like that on purpose. Come on. Good girl. All right, Sandy, come. Yes, good dog. I can see that there's something in that corner that's bothering her a little bit. She keeps uh, checking it out every single time we go by. I think I'm gonna not worry about it. Uh, 
hopefully she has enough positive experiences right now that will stop bothering her. And let's see, let's see how she does this time. Hey, Rain, let's go together. Good girl. Yes, she is. Good girl. Go. Yes. Good dog. Very, very nice. Very good. As your subject starts to master this command on a six-foot leash. Good girl. Go. Yay, good dog. You can add another six foot leash and then they're practicing from 12 feet. And you can keep on doing that until you run out of six foot leashes. You definitely don't want to practice without the physical control that a leash gives you. Because one of the ways to ensure that your dog succeeds is by giving them no option um, but to succeed, really. And so, if your dog starts to, starts to veer off but you have them on a leash, you can change the direction of your own, of your own action and then give them another chance to succeed. So that would look a little bit like this. Come. Good girl. Now she decided to go that way, I could go this way. Good. It's hard to demonstrate when she's being so, so, so successful. But if I don't have a leash at all, and my dog decides that they're not that interested in, in succeeding at the recall, I don't really have any way to, to fix that situation to help the dog to help the dog succeed. So again, we're not forcing the dog to come to us. We're never dragging them by the neck, um, but we do want to make sure that it is as likely as possible that the dog's going to succeed. Good girl, very nice. Friend, come! Oh, good girl, very very nice. Good job. Okay, so remember. We are not versus trainers at the SPCA. We do not rely on any techniques that require pain or fear to cause learning. We use hand signals that go like this, sit, down, and stay. We use a verbal signal for the recall. Oh, very nice. <laughs> um, and once dogs start to linger here in our adoption program, then we do start working with some, um, some leash skills. And uh, that comes a little bit later. So stay tuned for the next video. And again, thank you so much for your interest and for being here and for being willing to help us with this. This really, really helps the dogs go home faster, which enables us to bring more dogs into the program, which overall helps us save more lives. And we couldn't do without you. Thank you so much.